Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Widowson, and I'm here to talk about dead kids. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are we? Are we good? You're still here? That's awesome. Um, there might be a couple seats down in the audience, so if you're looking, if you've got one next to you, raise your hand like we're... Yeah, there's spots if you want them. No pressure. All right, let's get into this. <laughs> All right, I need everyone to take a moment and think about your childhood or preteen self. There was supposed to be a photo of me in brownies holding some binoculars, but my parents claimed to not be able to find the photo this week. <laughs> so think about what you believed in. Think about who you looked up to. Think about how strongly held your beliefs were. Now, imagine you're a peasant child in 1212. Since you're nearly the age of seven, you're expected to earn a living at this point. And at this point, you can also be executed for crimes like theft. And at 15, and if you're a boy, you could go and die for your country or your city state or wherever the fuck you're living. During the day, if you're not off dying for your country, you're pushing mud around in a field, maybe, and at night, you're at risk of death or disease or damnation. So when you see a remarkable child preaching on the corner of your town, talking about piety and bravery in the face of evil, quoting the Bible and saying that you, you child are the only hope for our sorry world. You child are the only one who can wrestle the holy lands away from the heathens. You might start believing him. <laughs> and when he promises a raucous adventure along the way in addition, going to faraway lands that you've only ever dreamed of or heard about from other people, you and your buddies might decide to leave your homes and join him. So, with thousands of others of, of excuse me, with thousands of other children, you travel for thousands of miles in one of the worst droughts in ages, going from town to town with your friends, begging for food, for water, because who was going to carry enough supplies, your children after all, continuing to take one step after another, determined to follow the strange shepherd boy who's got the big JC's ear or something. It's hard. This is a dory etch. <laughs> it's so hard. And along the way, your friends, old and new, either turn around and go home or decide to stay in the towns you pass through or they just die on the road alone. But you believe. My God, you believe and you keep on walking for the shepherd boy promised that once you reach the sea, the waters would part and you would have a straight shot to the Holy Land, that you would liberate Christ's birthplace from the infidels and save all of Christendom. <laughs> now imagine that you finally arrive on the banks of the Mediterranean and the fucking sea doesn't part. Would you continue following that boy? And especially, would you continue following that boy if it also meant almost certain enslavement and or death? So what are we doing here today, you're probably asking yourself. Well, we're here to discuss one of the most troubling stories of adventure and one of the most monumental fuck-ups in medieval history. There's also some, you know, mass hysteria and weird hero worship if you're into that. No, not that one. The Children's Crusade of 1212. And hey, I had some trouble pulling this together because in the nearly 20 times I've spoken on this stage, I don't know if you've noticed, but I use humor as a crutch when I don't know what things are. <laughs> and hey, what's funnier than thousands of kids dying because a bunch of old white religious fanatics leading a, leading a continent decided they needed to go and conquer and civilize people that look different from them? What's funnier than tales of heat stroke and delirium and starvation on what were essentially death marches? What's funnier than knowing that when, at the moment when those who'd survived and made it to the shore, the damn sea didn't part and a thousand wee tiny hearts broke in their tiny little chests because their leader wasn't the water-moving miracle worker they'd assumed him to be? <sighs> It should be noted at this point that Annette and Trey told me I have to end this talk on a positive note. 
and, and not on a slide filled with dead children. And to you, Anetta and Trey, I say I'll try, but I don't know, man, if I can do that. <laughs> because here's the background of the Children's Crusade. Following a disastrous Fourth Crusade in which the Christians of Europe once again failed to conquer the Holy Lands, Pope Innocent III was sending folks around the land saying, hey, let's get the conquering band back together and send them back to, to Jerusalem. In general, the Crusades, you know, holy wars, hot, fought by holy men with their holy armies, had a substantial impact on daily lives in Europe. The people had been parting with their taxes and their crops and their young men to furnish these crusader quests, and they were getting restless about the fact that, you know what? The unwelcome reality was that they hadn't taken the holy city back yet. The unwashed masses wanted results. So, as we mentioned, being a child in the 1210s was not nearly like being a child today, what with your TikTok and your Fortnite and wanting to save the planet from climate extinction. Not to sound like a disgruntled millennial, but kids in the 1210s seemed to be a lot tougher than we were, at least <laughs> in the 80s and 90s. To put it succinctly, as the Children's Crusade episode from the History of Crusades podcast said, there were, quote, <laughs> yeah, that exists, you should listen, it's good. Um, <laughs> there were, quote, a dizzying amount of ways you could die back in the Middle Ages. <laughs> so does it surprise you? I have no idea if this is related to this. I just thought it was really cool. Um, does it surprise you that there was probably more than one children's crusade, that two sprung up independently? Guess what? We're going to go over them. It should be noted that there is little to no information about these individuals, let alone images of them. So let's go back to this one and pick a kid. Great. We're going to go with him. So, in 1212, a young man in Germany who, for funsies, carried around a Tau cross because of course, set out to garner support for the Crusades. His name was Nicholas of Cologne, and he attracted 10,000 kids and led them over the Alps to Jerusalem. And look, I know I'm not good at directions, but that seems like a shitty way to get to the Middle East. <laughs> so supposedly, Nicholas got audience with Pope Innocent II, who was like, ha, ah, cute idea, kids, but I don't think you're going to be able to make this work. From there, we don't know what happened. We, we don't know what happened to the kids. But let, before you get any ideas, let's go on to our next hero. Second teenage prophet from the Vendome region of France. Also no images of him. So we're going to go with this emo medieval fellow when I googled <laughs> medieval boy. <laughs> so Stephen was a shepherd, which was a really convenient occupation to practice when you claim to have miraculously received a letter from Jesus himself. He was a hipster shepherd doing it before it was cool. <laughs> Telling him that he personally had the power to remove the Muslims from Jerusalem. So setting off from Vendome, Stephen took the children to Paris because he absolutely needed to show the king the letter that he got from JC himself. So Stephen rolls up, tries to get audience with King Philip II of France to tell him how he and Jesus were totes BFF, but Philip told him to fuck right off. <laughs> So what did Stephen do in this situation? Well, it's what you do whenever old, old people reject something cool. You start recruiting even more child followers to take over the Holy Land, as you do. Apologies to the boomers in the audience. Um, by the way, at this point, it is rumored that Stephen had gathered over 30,000 youths, mostly boys, and I can tell you that I can smell the Axe body spray from here. That is an elder millennial joke, and I stand by it. So, Stephen and his merry bands of tens of thousands set out for the Mediterranean, eventually ending up at Marseille, where, despite the heat and drought of the summer, locals actually welcomed them with room and board. But that's when calamity struck. <laughs> this has nothing to do with anything. I just really love this image. Because, thank you, because lo and behold, despite his promises, Stephen of Cloyes could not part the seas because science. And so... This crew of 30,000 children were left homeless in a foreign land. So, it makes sense that when two merchants, forebodingly named Hugh the Iron and William the Pig, offered the assembled kiddies passage to the Holy Land, some of the kids gave up at this point, but others were like, sure, there's no way getting on ships with strange men could end badly at this point. Which, of course, it did. According to legend, it turns out that those merchants double-crossed the children and, surprise, sold them into slavery. 
with most of them shipped off to Algeria, some of them executed for not converting, some went to Alexandria. This story sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. Train and Etta, I'm so glad I chose the dead children story as opposed to the other one, which was about building a highway. You know, I just, this is... <laughs> but watch me, we're gonna end this on a good note. Because guess what? We're gonna Scooby-Doo this. It might not have ever happened. In the late 70s, a Dutch historian by the name of Peter Reitz decided to actually dig in and see if these crusades happened. He wanted to know whether he could verify any of this, or were they sold, were they, did they die, did they return to their homes dejected and broken, knowing that no savior came. This story really affected me in a lot of different ways. <laughs> but anyway, couldn't find any contemporaneous accounts, couldn't verify the marchers were indeed children, could have been a popular march, couldn't verify it. A lot of the sources were either historians calling bullshit or super right-wing fundamentalist websites where I'm sure I'm on a watch list of some kind <laughs> at this point. But let's take some comfort in that, that this is basically a tale you tell to scare your children. I don't have children, but sure, I'm sure that parents do that, right? And when you think about it that way, when you think about them as cautionary tales, you start to understand why they might be popular in the time that they were popular. One, it shows the perils of disobe disobeying your parents and going out on your own. Two, it warns against following a charlatan who's outside of your existing religious circle. And three, it's a big fat scare tactic against the other. Think about it, two merchants, which back then often referred to Jews, steal children and sell them to the infidels who murder them for not converting? Pretty convenient way for parents to just pack that up in a little bow and tell your kid to like get in line. So in fact, I, I wanted to mention that a lot of these stories led to the story of the Pied Piper, who leads all the children of the town and in some tellings drowns them in the Wasser ri uh, River in Germany. So there is an element of this fable that I really appreciate, and that is the idea that at some point, kids and teenagers get so fed up with the fuckery around them that they decide to flip off propriety and manners, drum up support from their pe peers, excuse me, and scare the crap out of the establishment. Because that energy leads to movements like the 1963 Birmingham Children's Crusade where hundreds of children and teenagers attempted to engage in nonviolent protests for civil rights but were instead harmed and arrested. Or the March for Our Lives, created in response to mass shootings in this country. Or the Youth Climate March, because you know, everything's fucking melting. So, let's raise a glass to monumental movements and the youth that power them, even when they end in heartbreak. Cheers. Cheers.